Welcome to a preview of This Didn't Happen, a time-traveling card game coming to Kickstarter in early 2022. Thank you, Island of Bees, for sending us this prototype to check out. We mainly reviewed this game just so people would stop saying you're not about the new hotness. No, I'm joking. This Didn't Happen was designed by John Heffernan, an indie game designer out of Calgary, Alberta, here in Canada. Features artwork from Z. Miguel. John plans to launch a Kickstarter in early 2022 for This Didn't Happen, and will be printing the game under his own company, Island of Bees, if it hits its funding target. Now, This Didn't Happen plays one to four players, with games taking from as little as 15 minutes, if you really mess up the time stream, to about an hour. Please be aware that this review is based on a prototype of This Didn't Happen. While the game has been fully developed and playtested, it is possible that the components and rules could change by the time the game is published. So This Didn't Happen is a cooperative card game where you take on the role of, a of time travelers trying to stop the apocalypse. This is done by traveling to various spots on the timeline spread over three eras. The Medieval Era, the Great War Era, and the Lunar Era. You'll need to work together to research the timeline, collect resources, and intervene during key events in order to shift the timeline in your favor. Be careful, though. Altering the timeline can cause a cascade of changes going forward from that point in time on, and it's very easy to do more harm than good. Normally, this is where I would point you to an unboxing video to check out the components in This Didn't Happen. But... Due to the fact that this game is a prototype and there's a chance like things like artwork, iconography, and component quality could change, we skipped doing an unboxing video for this game. Now, my prototype copy came shipped in a tuck box and consists of just cards. Lots of two-sided cards. Now, these cards are quite glossary and slippery, which actually caused some problems during play with cards spinning on the table and revealing what was meant to be hidden information. Now, I'm pretty sure this is just due to the fact it's a prototype, and I do hope it'll be improved in the final version. Now, you get cards for three different timelines, three different eras, 12 main and three end-of-era cards for each, four characters and four character mode cards to go with them, a time machine card and a health tracker for it, a set of apocalypse cards, event cards, and paradox cards. Now, the artwork here is solid, as is the iconography, though it does take a bit to figure out exactly how you're meant to put these cards together when using them. We honestly never did quite figure out where you were supposed to put resource cards once you put them on the timeline. Which is unfortunate, as this game is supposed to be play-ready and just components really changing. Sadly, all too often we're getting these preview games that aren't quite as fully playable as their designers believe. Well, thankfully, with a Kickstarter launching and other review copies out there, they'll get enough notice from people who can see that before it hits the public and get these things fixed. Now, the rulebook for the game, interestingly, ships separately and is definitely still a work in progress. For one, it's way longer and more detailed than it needs to be and really needs an edit for clarity. The format's a bit odd as well because it's more like a, when you get a sample chapter from a novel than a board game rulebook with like a hard soft cover cover on it. Again, this is likely due to the fact it's a prototype at this point. Because for one, there's no way that rule book fits inside the box I got. Now, it's going to take you a couple of reads to figure out exactly how to play. And having the game set up in front of you is key to trying to figure this game out. You're also probably going to want to head over to the Island of Bees website and look at the graphics and digital tutorials they have out there for how to set up the game and how to play. Rule books are a skill on their own, mm -hmm. and it is so frustrating to see people thinking of them as an afterthought, when really they are often the first part of a game that will set the expectations and mm -hmm. opinions for everything that comes after. So I was recently listening to the Ludology podcast, a fantastic podcast, and I heard a great tip from Professor Scott Rogers on writing rule books. He said, don't sit down and write. Don't just sit down to write a rule book. Because when people sit down to write, they tend they feel tend to feel they need to explain everything and they need more words than they actually do and over explain everything. Instead, the key is to teach the game and record yourself doing so and then transcribe that into rules. I think is a great suggestion. Absolutely. Well, now that we have some idea of what we are in for and what you should uh, be getting with a copy of That Didn't Happen, how about you give us an overview of play? 
So the first hurdle in playing this didn't happen is setting up the game. This is quite fiddly. First, you're going to separate all the decks and shuffle them. Then you got to build the timeline, which again consists of three eras. You do this by taking all of the cards for each era and making a row five spaces long, with each space consisting of two cards stacked on top of each other in kind of a heart-shaped pattern. Now, cards should be placed so the black icons are showing and the red are hidden behind. You do this for all three eras, and you'll be left with two cards at the end that aren't used, which is a great way to add replayability to the game. So I do appreciate that. Next, each era has an end of era card that goes in the end. There's three of these. Those are randomized. You're going to put one face up again with the black showing, with the, the black symbol showing face up. I mean, as long as you don't box your cards while shuffling, there are certainly worse games to set up. Yeah, though it's a little awkward because you're boxing them and placing them, right? So for each spot, you place a card with the red side up, then place another card from the same deck with the black side up. So it is a matter of flip-flop, flip-flop, flip-flop. And when you are putting it away, it is a bit of a pain to put everything back to the right order. Next, you're going to determine which apocalypse you will be facing by randomly selecting two of the apocalypse cards and placing those so the artwork faces upright. Now, again, the cards overlap in a unique way, but it's more of a Y than a heart this time. Now, it is recommended the first time you play, you use the cards The Hungry and Monster, making your apocalypse be The Hungry Monster. Other combinations have rules that change some aspect of how the game is played, making it harder for the players, where Hungry Monster just has symbols you need to match. No additional rules. Well, it's certainly nice to see the replayability and beginner mode right there in the goal cards, mm -hmm. as well as you mentioned in the timeline cards, giving you that replayability. Now, next, each player picks a character. There are four of them, and they choose which side of the character card to have face up. So one has a female presenting version. The other has a male presenting version of the same character, and each features different skills and unique abilities. Now, along with this, players have a mode card, which can be tucked under the character in two ways. So depending on which side of the mode card you want to see. Now, this contains more skills, which side you choose will affect the event phase when we get to describing that. Now, when a character is injured, the mode card is flipped and the character will lose one of their skills. Oh, certainly flip when injured is a common enough mechanic. Yep. Next, you place the time machine with a health tracker card under it, showing the right damage level. Uh, normally in a one player game, it starts at eight and you subtract two health for every additional player. So the more players you have, the less health the time machine has. Now you're gonna place the time machine and all your characters on the first set of cards in the lunar timeline. You're gonna kind of stack all those together with your character cards and your mode cards tucked underneath on top of the thing. And then the time machine goes in there somewhere below or above. Um, as I said, it's fiddly. And I gotta say right at this point, the first time I read to do this, I was like, no, I'm not doing this. There's no way. I went and grabbed some meeples. I actually have some nice glass meeples I got as a Christmas gift. And I went and broke those out because I don't get to use them often. Uh, you can grab meeples, pawns, components from another game, dice, pennies, whatever you happen to have. That's probably going to be a way better way to represent where your characters are. Because all of the stacking of cards is just too fiddly. And it's even worse than when you're there, you now have to move them. So what if the third character in the stack is now moving somewhere else? You need to unpile that stuff to get the third. It's just a mess. And it just gets worse once you start playing because now you start putting cards under and over those timeline cards. Right. So uh, when you flip when injured, so your player has a, is, is, is binary injured and yes. then the, the uh, time machine has hit points. Yes. Okay. That's what I was yeah. missing earlier. All right. Yeah. So your character is injured or not. And if you're injured, once you're injured, you end up being unconscious for the rest of that time period and you move to that end of era card. But that's a little more fiddly than I want to get in this review. Um, if the time machine blows up, you actually get to keep playing, but then there's no way to jump through time. You're just going to progress through time again until you get stuck at that end of era. Fair enough. And now, as we were mentioning about all this stacking of cards and whether you should or shouldn't, remember that the current cards we have are also high gloss slippery yes. cards. So yes. not only is trying to get them stacked in the right order problematic, getting them to stay there is problematic. Yeah, they like, to, they like to spin and shift. So next up, remember, we're still setting up the game here. You shuffle the event deck, the paradox deck, and the three resource decks. Now, the three resource decks um, go with each of the timelines. You put those at the end of each timeline. Now you're ready to play. So the goal in a game of this didn't happen is to prevent the major apocalypse, the big apocalypse. 
Each two card combination will give you a set of five symbols you need to make show to prevent the apocalypse. Now it's your job to manipulate the timeline by intervening in some areas while protecting others to get those five symbols showing face up. Now you do that by collecting resources and spending them at specific spots in the timeline. Now first, you're gonna have to research though to find out what cards you need to alter and which cards you need to protect. And then you actually have to go do the altering. When you actually make an alteration to the timeline, you swap the cards front to back and then new red symbols will be showing. Now, if you're already getting lost, don't worry. It's confusing, <laughs> yes, but then so is time travel. Right? So here's the interesting bit. Once you've altered a card, you are going to look at every card in the future, going down the timeline towards the lunar era, towards the apocalypse, and you have to check and see if those red symbols, now cards that card could be altered as well. You're going to go card by card, looking to see if any red symbols show up that match that card. And if they are, they flip. And then the next card you look at, you're looking at the red cards on the original card you flipped and the other card you flipped to see if that flips. And you end up with this big cascading chain reaction. Now, if you manage to get all of the symbols on the apocalypse card showing in red, you win. But only if you didn't ruin the timeline while doing so. Because each of those end of the era cards shows two symbols on them. And these have to still be showing in the timeline in black in that era. So at the end of the Great War, you need to have the power symbol and the religion symbol, say. I'm just making this up the top of my head. And if you don't anymore because you altered the timeline, that flips and becomes another apocalypse. And while you can't win if there are any apocalypses, what apocalypse side, what uh, multiple ending of the worlds. So what the game is actually about is deducing which cards to alter which to leave alone, and which you need to protect. Everyone got it now? Clear as mud? Great. <laughs> Good to go. All right, so how you do this. You're going to do this through a number of phases, starting with the travel through time phase. This is pretty simple. Here are players in order of their position on the timeline, either move from the time machine to any point in the timeline, or move from any point in the timeline back to the time machine, or stay where they are. So there's no flipping. This is just moving around for position for later stages. Yeah, you're just moving into position to do something later. Okay. So next is the action phase. Here's the meat of the game. Again, in order determined by the timeline, person furthest back in time goes first, which kind of makes sense because they're in what they do will affect the other players. Will do actions. Now these actions include gathering resources, which is pretty simple. Draw a resource card. Do research, which lets you look at the red symbols that are covered at any point on the timeline previous to where you are in the same era. So if you're at the end of the lunar era, you can look at, say, the start of the lunar era. Uh, you can rest, which is healing if you're injured. You flip that card we mentioned earlier. Uh, you can cash resources. This is a neat time travel thing where you can send cards to other players who are further up the timeline. That's your whole, you know, Bill and Ted, we left the thing in the thing. And now here it is, right? Um, you've got that. Uh, you can intervene in current events. And the way you do that is you're going to spend a resource card and you're going to put it under the cards on the timeline. Now, if the symbols on those cards ever match the symbols on the top card, it's going to flip and change the timeline. No, it might take several steps to intervene. So I could drop a resource, then Sean can come in on a later turn, drop another resource, and it's only then that it flips. Or you might drop a really big resource that causes it to flip right away. You can protect time, because when you flip that, you might not want the next one to flip over, because that'd be horrible. So what you can do instead is place your resources on top, and now you need the resources on the symbol to show, as well as the ones on the card. So the resource adds to the number of symbols you need, so it makes it harder to have that spot altered later. And then if you mess all this up and you figured it out and haven't lost yet, you can also uh, commit what's called temporal suicide, which I have learned they are going to change that name to temporal sacrifice because we don't want to make light of suicide. What this lets you do is revert a previous intervention or protection by removing all the cards that are currently there. So while there didn't seem to be all that much happening in phase one, suddenly things get busy. Yes. Now, once everyone has taken one action, you only get to do one of those things. And to be honest, when you're sitting there, it seems like that's it. That's all I get to do. It, 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 it's an odd feeling. Once you've done your one, everyone has done their one action, you're going to draw an event card. These are broken up into three areas, one for each of the three timelines. And depending on where you are on the timeline, you're going to impact that part of the event card. 
Now, most of these are going to have you check your character and their mode card and resources you have to see if you have the symbols that are on the event card. Now, events can be good or bad. Some events will cause you to draw paradox cards. Now, paradox cards are permanent cards that affect gameplay in some negative way for the players. A neat rule is that only one can be in play each turn, but you could have multiple paradoxes. And at the start of the turn, you actually shuffle to see which paradox is affecting you for that turn. All right. Well, I mean, there's a lot to unpack there, but really it's a lot more common easy than that second phase, which, which oh, got yeah. a little out of hand. Yes. Now, through the event phase thematically, I like the name of this, is everyone experiences history, which is just a fancy way of saying, look under the card you're standing on to see what red symbols are there. Now, note, if a player or the time machine is in an apocalypse at this point, so either in the final apocalypse or if you've got one of those apocalyptic end of an eras, you're going to take damage. If the time machine's destroyed again, no one can move through time and they're just going to keep progressing each phase until they hit those end of the era which is the next part, which is the final phase, which is everyone moves through time. Everything shifts one space down the timeline towards the apocalypse, including the time machine. Understandable. Uh, I'd say that that makes sense, but I don't want to tell listeners how many times I have read through this script and I'm still not sure I'm getting everything. And that is exactly how I felt reading the rule book. So I, I sympathize with you. I fully understand. You kind of need it in front of you. And trust me, that first game, you're probably not going to do it right. I'm not saying play extreme. You're just not going to realize the effect of these different actions. But we'll get more into that more when we get into our thoughts. So some of the rule bits that really didn't fit in the above that I do think should be mentioned. Uh, you can only hold three resources. Resources will give characters symbols they can use for events, as well as symbols that they can use to tuck the cards to either protect or get them to flip eventually. Many resource cards also have additional rules. Every resource card seemed to be beneficial, though some did wound you for taking them, but they tended to give a good bonus. It's also worth noting that once a spot on the timeline is altered due to a chain reaction, so you didn't go there and spend resources, it flipped on its own because of something you did, there is no way to take it back at all. There is no way to revert it. What's done is done. Also, there is a strong memory element to this game. When you experience the timeline or you use the research action, you get the peak, right? You get to look at the buried red symbols, but then you cover them back up before the end of the round and you're not allowed to look without researching again. And sadly, this is where it loses me. I mean, I guess I could take notes, but I'm not a fan of memory requirements in game in large part, because often I'm gaming for me is social. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're being social during games, it makes it that much harder to remember the three little red symbols on that one card you looked at three turns ago, yep. even if your memory is good. No, I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, that is something that I think many groups will want to host rule. Because if you're going to take notes anyway, you may as well just be able to look at the cards. So thematically, I guess it might make sense. So one other rule is if your character is on the timeline, on a timeline spot, when the card gets altered, so again, you weren't planning on this happening. The card gets altered from a chain reaction. Or actually, you could plan for it to happen, but it wasn't you changing the time, your character doing it. It's, it's from a chain reaction. You're going to flip your character card over. And remember, they present differently and have different abilities on the other side. And what this represents is that something someone did in the past changed your birth in some way. Now, character mode can be changed at any time. That's the other card you've got tucked underneath. Again, there's some more tucking and facing. You can flip that anytime, but only during the action phase, which I found a little odd because this means you have to decide your mode before you see the event card that's about to come up. So you're kind of gambling a bit there. Now, each character also has two special game breaking abilities. Each are based on what side your character's on. And these include all kinds of break the rule things, right? Like move around the time machine without, or timeline without using the time machine, but you damage yourself. That's the Doctor Who like character. Um, another character gets to draw two event cards and pick which one. Another gets to draw extra resource cards and so on. Each of them has, each of the four characters has two different abilities depending on which side of the card you're using. Right. So if you're caught in one of those cascades, surprise, you're now your own son or something. Yes. <laughs> The game does not give you a distinct what happened. That's up to you if you want to do some storytelling. There you go. Now, I realize this is a lot to take in, 
And that's with me still trying to keep things pretty high level. I did want to mention all the different actions. Maybe I should have been a little, I don't even know if more succinct or more vague would have been better. I've said it before and I'll say it again. This is a fiddly game. This applies to how the mechanics work as well as the actual physical manipulation of components. In general though, just to kind of overview, because just to, to make this make a little more sense. So you start off the game, basically heading out to collect resources and experiencing the timeline, looking for the right red symbols that match your apocalypse. Eventually you're gonna find the right symbols and now you have to start figuring out which cards you have to protect and getting people onto those cards and playing resources to basically shore them up so that when you do change timeline, you don't have side effects you didn't want. Then once you think you have everything right, then only then do you start affecting the timeline and hope you didn't miss something. There's where that memory element can come in big. Now, while that's happening, you're gonna be dealing with random events and hoping the time machine doesn't blow up along the way. Okay, well, now that we've got some idea of how to play, hopefully, <laughs> what did you think of this didn't happen? Because that last bit sounded a lot like some heavy quarterbacking can occur. Yeah, that is definitely something that is part of this game. It's one of those, this is a co-op where you are going to have to work together, and that could lead to quarterbacking. But first, though, I want to say, learning this game was rough. So first off, as mentioned earlier, the rule book format is a little strange. It's, it's more like reading a short textbook than a board game rule book. And it really could use an edit for succinctness and clarity. Now, normally I can sit down and read a rule book somewhere else, which is what I did in this case. I was in a parking lot while my daughter was in for therapy and I read the rule book. And when I got home, I was like, all right, now we're going to play. And it was like, I don't even know. I, I, I read this, but it's not making sense. And I got to say, just reading the rules did not get it across. And it wasn't until we sat down and started playing that any of it really made sense, which I'm sure is how probably most of you feel listening to my description of the game. That first game involved a lot of rule referencing. And while I got to say, everything's there in the book, just the format's not what you expect. And it wasn't easy to find. And it was one of those rule books where you'd find rules in weird places, like there'd be a description of the card and then later how the card's used and then like in the action section, but then a section in the back about say the time machine that finally says where your starting health should be. Like it just wasn't, it's all in there, just not easy to find. But never underestimate the power of a good rule book. Now, even when we did finally figure out how the mechanics work, it took a couple more plays to figure out what we were supposed to do with these mechanics to have any chance of winning. Our first game was amusingly quick. As we started off, spread across the timeline and grabbing a couple resources, then someone in the, the Old West saw one symbol we needed. And we're like, oh, they did a research action. Like, we need that symbol. We quickly did everything we could to alter that timeline card, which was in the medieval era. It was like the first or second card. And then we flipped it and almost every single card in the entire tableau was affected. The one just flipped the next one and that flipped the next one. And then this one was flipped because the second one was flipped. And by the time we got to the second era, all the symbols were up three times. It was just over. And to be honest, the total play time for that game was probably about 15 minutes and 10 minutes of that was set up and explaining the rules. Like the setup was longer than the game. You killed your grandfather, didn't you? Yes, something. We we caused. I can't remember now, but like the 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 Axis uh, won the war. I forget what happened in the medieval times. I think the Paladin was slain. Like because there's there's like a description of what happens to each of these. The lunar era. I think the robots took over. Like it, we had all four apocalypses happened. We we had no chance chance whatsoever. And it honestly took a few more plays before we started to grok. The deduction aspects of this game, which is something I missed, like reading the rules and looking it up online and hearing it's a half hour game. I expected something a little light. It's not about jumping around, changing things and seeing what happens. It's actually about careful research, figuring out exactly what you need to change and what you have to do to make sure other things don't change. It's only once we discovered that key aspect of play, that the game actually started to be more fun. So I gotta admit, the, the first crash was kind of amusing. Now that we know how the game should be played, it's actually way easier for me to introduce the game to new players and for setting expectations before we start playing. 
letting players know this is a puzzle. This is a deduction and memory game with some interesting random elements. And this is not a game about playing around to see what happens is very important to getting people to enjoy this game. Yeah, just seeing what happens in history is how you get Black Mirror even sooner. <laughs> now, jumping back to that memory element, we kind of mentioned a bit here. This is the one part of the game that I'm not a huge fan of, but one that's easily fixed. While I get that thematically it makes sense, you may forget your research or forget what happened to you in the past, adding a memory element to what's already a difficult puzzle can be too much, especially with younger players. I actually recommend playing without this rule while you're learning to play the game. Only introduce it once you've actually managed to save the timeline a few times. Or for those with lousy memories, take notes. Fair. Now, my biggest complaint about this didn't happen is just how fiddly everything is. The turn order even feels fiddly. There's just something about the fact where you travel, you travel, you travel, you travel. Okay. Now you do an action, you do an action, you do an action, you do an action. Okay. Now everyone gets an event. Okay, it just feels weird, and I don't know, it just seems like it'd be much easier to have one player do all of it. So you travel, take an action, deal with an event, experience time, move forward, next player, go. That just seems more succinct and easy to me. Now, maybe it's just me that I'm used to other games where players tend to take all their actions in one action, especially the move, then do something. Maybe if you just put those two phases together, it would feel more comfortable to me. But for some reason, it just feels weird. It just like adds to the, the awkwardness of the game. Yeah, it does feel like a somewhat older way of doing things. Uh, not quite outdated, but leaning a little bit in that direction compared to modern yeah. games. Uh, we also thought the fact you have to choose your mode in the action phase when it affects you in the event phase a little weird. So I got to admit that was only at first. Once we started to see how resources give you more skill symbols, Shifting your mode made more sense. You're like, whoa, I have a gun. I don't need as many fist symbols now because I have a gun, so I can switch my mode over to my investigative side instead of my stealth side or whatever. And I guess it's thematic that you wouldn't know what events are coming. Yeah, no, time travel is mysterious to the best of us. <laughs> now, as mentioned earlier, a lot of this fiddliness comes from the components themselves. The way you stack cards in this game. Well, effective as a way to show information, the whole parts and why kind of shapes, it's just strange and weird. Uh, then you get into the whole stacking multiple cards at one location, which could be a ton of stuff. You got two timeline cards, a character card with their mode card, the time machine with its health card, any number of resources, cards either stacked below or above it. Now, a chunk of this is easy to fix, right? Just do what I suggested earlier, grab some type of counter. And to be honest, that's even suggested in the rules. But I got to say, it seems really strange to me that something that makes that big of an impact and improvement on gameplay just isn't included. This is something I really hope comes out during the Kickstarter, um, either from fan feedback or maybe as a stretch goal or something, a way to include a time machine mini or character miniatures or meeples or literally pawns in different colors that are colorblind friendly would be awesome. Yeah. And again, high gloss cards, hard to stack. Where's the linen finish that would allow these to have a little bit of grip? Yeah, and I, I really do think that's a prototype issue. Um, some of the bleed on the cards isn't great, and some of the cutting is not even perfect. I think that's just, I don't actually know where this came from, if it's drive through cards or Game Crafter, or the, it could be the designer cut them themselves. I don't know. Fair. I, I really do think that's something that will be improved. So that's actually not a concern of mine at this point. But yeah, now uh, with my particular copy, it can be frustrating. Now, okay. I realize this sounds like a lot of negatives, but the thing is a lot of these problems can be cleaned up with a good solid edit of the rules, some better clarity on how to manage the cards, graphical examples of how to stack things, and possibly the inclusion of counters and tokens. Hidden under all this fiddliness is a rather solid and engaging game. Once everything clicked in place, both with how each of the actions and phases worked as well as once we figured out how we should be using those actions, we found a rather fun game. The deduction aspects are interesting, with players spreading out over the timeline, experiencing time, learning what symbols are hidden where, collecting resources for dealing with events, and eventually affecting the timeline. And I gotta say, that moment when you do finally make your first change in the timeline, and slowly begin flipping over the cards and moving card to card, trying to see if you caused a chain of effects you didn't expect, 
is very tense and really engaging. Everyone's standing up at this point, leaning over the table. Then that feeling you get when you got it right, you did all the right things, you didn't cause a new apocalypse to happen, is a wonderful feeling. Of course, this is surprising when you finally do manage to prevent the final apocalypse and keep all the errors intact. It's even more enjoyable. And there's even joy in putting the plan together, acting it out, and watching it work. And there's even fun to see when it fails miserably. So it sounds like, really, for the right people, this game has a solid potential. I do agree. It's going to take different, different gamers are going to take to this. This is not going to be a, a big hit. Everyone's going to get it. Everyone should own it. Definitely not. Because overall, despite being a bit of a fiddly mess that took quite a bit of time to fully figure out, we're now really enjoying this didn't happen. It's more of a cooperative puzzle to solve than a game. And that's not a bad thing. Figuring out what aspects of your timeline have to be changed in order to prevent an apocalypse can be a lot of fun. Just be sure you have some meeple or something on hand to represent your character, just to save some of that card manipulation hassle. Very fair. So, of course, the big question here is, should you back? This didn't happen when it launches on Kickstarter. Or, assuming it funds, pick it up once it's released to the public. And I got to say, it depends. I hate using it depends, but it really depends on you and your group. Now, I say you and your group because, or your group, I should say you or your group, because this game actually plays extremely well solo. It actually feels like it was designed as a solo game and they added in additional players. Though I got to admit, solo, it's hard not to peek at some previously researched cards if you're trying to be a purist. Now, for one, you or your group are going to have to enjoy cooperative games and games that can lend themselves to alpha games. If you don't like alpha gamers at your table, you probably want to skip this game completely. You're also going to have to enjoy games with a memory element, unless, of course, you just totally ignore that rule. And you're going to have to be willing to deal with some physical fiddling, both during setup and play, even if you've got counters. Now, if you haven't been scared away yet, I think this could be a great game for you or your group. So definitely not for those with some dexterity limitations and probably not for folk with visual restrictions as well, I guess. Yeah, I would, I would say definitely. Um, text on the cards is big. The icons are pretty clear, but still, there, there may be some color issues that I'm not aware of as well. Now, if you or your group love puzzles and deduction games, this is a game you're going to want to check out. It's because it's unique. It's very different. This isn't a chronicle of crimes. This isn't an exit game. It's a very different type of deduction game. And it's not social deduction. There's no traitors. There's no betrayer to worry about in this game. This is definitely a different style of puzzle game. And it's very different from anything else I played. Here's where the stuff like the fiddly bits and the complicated setup actually shine because they allow it to provide such a unique puzzle to solve every game. And while there is replayability built into this already, it seems from what I can uh, see about it that expansions uh, to give you even more are certainly possible. Yep. But, of course, if the game doesn't see enough support in Kickstarter, we may never see those to, uh, to see the expansion. Yeah, it's very well. In one year's time, we could be talking about a this didn't happen again or this didn't happen yet. That is possible. Now... The other place I encourage people to check this game out are your time travel friends, whatever method of time travel that may be. Uh, while it's a pretty abstract game overall, there are a lot of interesting mechanics that only really work thematically because it's a time travel game, like being able to research anything that happened in your era before the period you were in, right? Makes sense. You could go to a library. You can look up historical records. You can read the news. You can look it up on your lunar cell phone and find out what happened. Uh, the ability to cash items is fantastic, right? It's the Bill and Ted thing. It's uh, I drop this here so that another character can get it later. That's perfect. And while the whole cascade effect of changing one simple thing, like, trust me, the first time you change something in medieval era, ooh, <laughs> there's way too much stuff that can change before you get to the end of the timeline there. Yeah, it's, I would say it feels more for the Back to the Future Bill and Ted fans than for Doctor Who fans when it comes to time travel. But it's definitely in there. Yeah, I mean, it's a different kind of Who. The, once you start reading the events, that's where I got the Who feel. Um, there's definitely some background that went into this game that I'm curious about. 
um what are they i'm trying the lunar children there, there's a faction in the lunar era that, that obviously is doing all kinds of bad things that keep coming up in the event cards and you often run into other time travelers or yourself uh you make yourself often on the cards that gave me a doctor who feel more than the mechanics and changing the timeline now, personally, what I am really looking forward to seeing is what happens with this. What, where is this didn't happen going to go? Is it going to turn out like this I, with, with a little bit more spit and polish? I would love to see that. I want to see what the new card quality is. I would love to see a more clarified rule book. I, I want to see what this can become because I like what it is now. It just feels like it just needs that little bit more to make it even more engaging and more accessible to more people. I look forward to checking this out when it goes live on Kickstarter in the new year. Well, that's it for our preview of This Didn't Happen. Feel free to also check out Mo's written review over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com.